In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today is the third Sunday of the Holy Great Fast, and we read the story of the prodigal son, the parable that the Lord Christ gave that uh, illustrates uh, a very beautiful example of repentance. We read in Luke 15, 13, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. This was the temptation that the son experienced, that even while he was living in the house of the father, he felt this pull to the world, a desire to take all of the possessions that he felt was owed to him, and to go and to spend them according to his desire, however he wished, thinking that this is going to bring him joy and satisfaction in his life. And this was the temptation that he experienced, which then, of course, caused him to go out to waste all his possessions and then ultimately come to repentance and to return again to his father, whom he accepted him again. And as we said last week that we are going to discuss, um, uh, have a two-part series. Last week we spoke about the principles of temptation, of how to understand temptation, which during this period of the great fast, we experience it maybe more strongly than any other time because we are making the greatest effort to overcome. We're making the greatest effort to live ascetically, to fight against um, temptation, to control ourselves, to be self-disciplined. And so as we are trying to do this, we might experience temptations even more strongly upon us because the devil is trying to attack us um, so that we do not continue um, what we are doing. So last week we spoke about temptations generally. God willing, today we're going to discuss a few points about how to overcome temptations. When we are experiencing these temptations, um, many times our feeling is that there is nothing that we can do to overcome them. There is nothing that we can do. And so for that reason, I might as well give in to them and not even put up any fight whatsoever because we know ourselves and that even if we try to fight, even for a short period of time, we feel that we are going to fall. So why even bother to put any effort? Why bother to try to do good? If knowing ourselves, we know that every time we try to do good, we, f we fall again. And yet the Lord tells us that there is benefit in fighting. Even if ultimately we give in to a certain temptation, the more that we fight, the more that we conquer. The more that we fight, the more we are leading ourselves and we're allowing God to lead us out of a place where, of temptation and to grow in the spirit, to grow strong, to be able to overcome the temptations that the, that the devil sends upon us. So we should not believe the lie that there is no point and that there is no benefit in fighting, that there is no point in self-discipline, because the, when we look at those people who came before us and those people who are the kind of the, the, the pinnacles of virtue that we look to, like the lives of the saints, like the fathers, like people who maybe we know in our lives that are, are living kind of in a very holy and righteous way, they were able to attain this, not because they are somehow different than anyone else, but because of their earnest desire because of their earnest struggle because of the work of the holy spirit in them and so we want to speak today about overcoming temptation what is it that we can do to help us to equip us that while we are in this phase of the great fast and of course at all times that whenever the temptation comes upon us we don't just give up and give in and say there's no point in me fighting but instead say no there is something that i can do to overcome and to believe that with the power of god indeed we can overcome the first thing that we need to do to overcome temptations is to read the Word of God, to read it and to meditate on it and to understand it. In Psalm 119 verse 11, it says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. What does these two things have to do with one another? Hiding the Word of God in our heart and sinning. The more that we meditate on the Word of God, the more that we remember the words of God, the more that we apply the words of God in our life, the more that we, it, we are stronger and able to overcome sin. Even as we re read a story today like the prodigal son, how many times do we use this as a story, as an example, to apply it to everyday situations that we experience and that other people experience around us? The Word of God is practical. The more that we understand it and the more that we allow it to to, to enter into us and to kind of settle inside of us in the deepest parts. And what it says is, I have hidden the word of God in my heart. 
like I've allowed the word of God to sink deep inside of me, that from all of my reading of it, it has become a part of me, a part of my thinking, the way that I approach the world. How is it they respond to things in the world? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is, what would God want me to do? What is, what is it that God has said about the situations that I face? And so it becomes more natural for me to respond to things in a godly way that I respond by meditating on the love of God meditating on the ways that God has shown love for me and has cared for me and is asking me to stay away from sin this is the first thing to overcome temptation is that we have to know what God says what God says about temptation and what what God has done for us the love of God toward us that would make us want to follow him and obey him the second thing is to remember our commitment to God in Genesis 39, verse 9, when Joseph is um, tempted with sin, he says, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? When we remember what is it that God has done for us and what he continues to do for us and what is it he is offering us and the eternal life, the door of eternal life that he has opened for us, when we are faced in that situation of temptation, instead of being only consumed with desire, and only consumed with the object of our temptation, if we pause and we say, what is it that God has done for me? What is it that God is calling me for? What kind of life does God want me to live? And who am I? Am I a person who is in darkness and living in darkness away from God? Or am I a person who is called to a, to a life and to light and to joy and to eternity? And then this is actually my identity and whom, whom I am in Christ. And if we remember who we are, that we are redeemed, that we are called by the blood of Christ, that we are purchased by his blood, that we have been granted forgiveness and salvation, that we have been imbued with the power of the Holy Spirit, and that we remember all these things, and we remember the commitment that we made to God, then we can break the temptation that we are experiencing that comes from the devil who wants us to forget all these things. He wants us again to think that there is no purpose in fighting, that no matter what we do, we are always going to be sinners and there's no point in even putting up any kind of struggle at all. Even though, the, of course, it is, it is possible for us to go astray, but we can always come back again. The prodigal son, even as he was in the lowest point and having wasted all of his possessions and desiring to eat the food of pigs, he still remembered who his father was. He said, you know what, if I go back to my father, then maybe he will accept me even as a hired servant. But at least he remembered. He remembered who he was. He remembered who his father was. He remembered that he had a relationship with his father and that allowed him to return again. So we have to remember who we are. Remember identi our identity. Remember the commitment that we made before God. Number three is that as we are fleeing evil, we should also be pursuing good. It is not possible just to cut out evil from our life and that's it. In order to cut out evil, in order to cut out temptation, in order to, to, to flee sin, we have to also pursue something that is positive, pursue something that is good. I tell people who are maybe trying to cut down on their media consumption. So if a person is using a media for several hours a day, say, I'm going to stop watching the media. Okay, so what are you going to do with that time? The time that now you are stopping something, you have to redirect that time towards something else. In 1 Timothy 6.11, it says, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. How is it that we are going to pursue? We pursue God through our readings. We th pursue God through our prayers. We pursue God in our church attendance, in our partaking of the sacraments. We pursue God in serving others. We pursue God in serving in the church. We pursue God by trying to struggle against sin. And the more that we struggle, the more that we flee evil and the more that we pursue good, the more we will find that God is granting us success. If we want to have success fighting against sin, then we can't just keep doing the same thing that we have always done. Because if we have done it again and again and again, whatever it is we have done in the past, and, and there have been, there's been no benefit, there's been no change, there's been, there's been no effect on us in terms of being able to cut out sin in our lives, that means that the thing that we are doing is not working, which means that we have to do something new, something different. If I truly care about cutting out sin, if I truly care about overcoming temptation, then I have to try until I find something that works. And something that, m more than any other thing, 
in my life that can grant me success is maybe something that doesn't come to mind as, as, as much. We, we tend to think of putting in all kinds of effort in all kinds of ways, but the number one thing that helps us to overcome temptation is prayer. Because we are bringing God into the fight. Instead of me being by myself fighting against temptation, fighting against my thoughts, fighting against what I see in the media, fighting against my, my wrong desires, I bring God into my life more and more, and He naturally overcomes all of these influences in us, in our lives. We have to pursue good. We have to pursue God even as we are trying to flee evil. Number four, we have to believe that Satan will flee from us if we choose to fight him. In James chapter 4, it says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do we believe that the devil will flee? Do we believe that when we are in the midst of the strongest temptation, and that we feel overwhelmed by it, and that we are about to fall into it, do we feel in that moment that there is a, a possibility that the devil can flee, that he can run away, that, that, that he can run away as from fire, because he cannot withstand the presence of God in us. This is what St. James is saying. Even though Satan is stronger than us, even though St. Peter says that he is a roaring lion seeking whom that he may devour, and yet we are stronger than him. We are more powerful than him in Christ. When God is with us, he runs away from us. When God is, is in us, he will flee from God. Again, there is no hope for us to overcome sin or to change our life or to pursue good apart from the presence of God in us. The number one thing if that we can learn and that we can practice during this time of the great fast is to pursue God, is to pray, is to be consistent and disciplined in our prayer, and we will find that this transforms our entire life. It makes us to be calmer. It makes us to have more peace. It makes it easier to forgive. It makes it easier to yield. It makes it easier to not be envious. It makes it easier to stop lusting. It makes everything about our life that God is calling us to live easier because the life that we are called to live as Christians is frankly impossible. It is not possible to do and to live everything that God asks us to do apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in us. So if we are not pursuing God, if we are not bringing the Holy Spirit and seeking help from the Holy Spirit in us, what hope do we have to do anything? What hope do we have to fast? What hope do we have to, to, to love one another, to love our enemies? What hope do we have if we are not asking God to help us? And then we will see that Satan is fleeing. He is running away because he cannot be in the presence of God in our lives. Number five. We have to ask God to preserve us from falling. Sometimes in the moment of temptation, we forget to call out to God. In the moment of temptation, when we feel overwhelmed, we forget that if I call and ask God for his assistance and his help and his presence, that he will answer that prayer. In Luke 22, it says, When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Christ in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he told the apostles, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. They didn't. They fell asleep. And they didn't do what he asked them to do. But do we ask God even, Pray that we would not fall into temptation. Sure, when we pray the Our Father prayer, the Lord's prayer, we ask God in it to deliver us from temptation. Yes, but in the midst of the temptation, when we feel like we are being overwhelmed and overcome, how often do we seek God in that moment? You know, one of the most beautiful prayers that we can pray is the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we can pray that over and over and over, and it's a very short prayer and a very easy prayer that we can pray at all times, in any place, regardless of where we are, we can pray it silently in our heads whenever we are experiencing any kind of temptation. Whenever someone does something to bother us and we are getting ready to judge them or we're, or we're feeling hateful toward them, we can pray the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God have mercy on me a sinner and we feel from God that we are filling our minds with this prayer that doesn't even give us the opportunity to think or to feel anything else but to redirect our focus to be only on God and this is why we call it an arrow prayer 
An arrow prayer meaning it's like an arrow directly between us and God. It like immediately changes the direction of, of our thoughts and our, and our feelings because we begin to focus on this prayer and not on the situation around us. We have to ask God to preserve. We have to I- realize that God is the one who protects, not that we can keep ourselves from temptation on our own. Number six, we have to trust in God's protection. Second Peter 2 it says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. If God is the one who knows how to deliver us from temptation, then we seek him. We go to him and we ask him, deliver us from temptation. Number seven is be confident of the victory in Christ. This is sometimes we, we, we completely don't remember the victory. We just feel defeated. We feel only as sinners that are far from God. St. Paul said to the Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as we fall, and even as we experience setbacks, and even as we fall into sin and to do things that are unbecoming, and do things that are sinful, and yet do we believe that we are separated from God, and that there is no way for us to return? Again, we see in the example of the prodigal son today, that no matter how far away someone goes from God, there is always a way to return. There is always a remembrance. There is always a path to return and to come back. And so we have to be confident that God can accept us again, and that he will accept us, and that Christ has conquered the devil. And so we, what we are doing is seeking as children of God to benefit from the victory that Christ has already won. He has already won. There is no question as to who is going to win the war. Christ has already won. We are just aligning ourselves with him. We are saying we are your children and we are on your side and we want to be with you. We, do, we want to have victory with you just as you have already conquered Satan. This victory is already accomplished. The last thing I want to say is... Um, in order to overcome temptation is that we have to be alert. Christ said to the apostles, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. When we are asleep spiritually, when we are not paying attention to our spiritual lives, when we are not aware of the temptations around us, when we make decisions kind of foolishly and quickly, allowing ourselves to have relationships or to have careers, or to spend time in places, or doing certain hobbies or activities that we know then can lead us to temptation and sin. And yet, instead of being alert, instead of being careful, instead of stopping ourselves from doing something that we are not strong enough in order to prevent ourselves from falling, we just let things go, we let things go, we let things go. We don't take action. We are not aware of ourselves and the surroundings and the people and the situations. And so as Christians, we kind of don't really do much to defend ourselves or to protect ourselves. Then this is, w- this is where we are going to fall. We are not stronger than anyone else. As Christians, we are not stronger in ourselves. We are strong, stronger in Christ, but we are not strong in ourselves. We are just as affected by sin and temptation as anyone else. And so we have to be very careful. We have to not allow ourselves to be put into situations that are definitely going to harm us or think that we are able to protect ourselves from temptation when we really cannot. Being alert, this is what Christ said. He said, rise and pray lest you enter in temptation. Be always alert and aware and protecting yourselves lest you fall. So the 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 eight, the ten or sorry the eight reasons we said we, or the t- the eight ways we said to overcome temptations. The first is reading the word of God and meditating on it. The second is remembering our commitment, our identity in Christ. The third is pursuing good while we are fleeing from evil. It's not enough just to run away from evil, but we have to pursue something that is good. Number four, believing that Satan will flee from us if we fight him. Number five, asking God to preserve us from falling. Six, trusting in God's protection. Seven, being confident of the victory in Christ. And finally, eight, being alert of the environment and and all the sources of sin around us. We ask God during this time of the great fast to, 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 to reawaken us again, to make us see that maybe the paths that we have walked are not the right ones, 
and to remind us that there is always a return. Just as the prodigal son was able to return, he was able to be restored. And when he was restored, he was restored far greater than what he was before he left. And that's another source of hope for us. The prodigal son, while he was in the father's house for his entire life, he looked from the outside that he was good. He looked from the outside that he was in the father's house. But his heart was far from the father. He, all he cared about was what he could get from the father. But after he left and returned, he had a completely different perspective and appreciation for what does it mean to be the son? What does it mean to be in the house? So we, we look to God and we ask him to use whatever situations that we have fallen into even in our life to bring us back again and to give us a renewed and even greater appreciation for him and the process of salvation and what is it that he has done for us. We ask God to fill us with his grace and to grant us protection from sin and glory be to God forever. Amen.